Welcome, everybody. Welcome. This is, this is the beginning of our wonderful workshop on, on uh, the power of holy language. I am so excited about this. This is also my new book, and which will be out next year. And so I have to sit down and have a good talk about this. First of all, uh, you know, there used to be a time when I could when I could teach in a very organized way. Uh, it impressed me, actually. <laughs> but now there's so much that tends to come through me. Hello, good evening. That tends to come in that um, it's hard when the subject, I'm just going to shut this, when the subject is of a mystical content. And the first thing I would like to do, the thing I would like to do this evening, is present a bit of an overview about what's happening in our world and in your world and in the world. I can't begin to communicate how important it is that you have an understanding of what's taking place in the world at a time that you're living, and I think there'll come a time when historians will say this was the most important time ever for human beings to be alive. You can't afford not to know this. You can't afford not to understand what's happening inside of you and to, to maybe recognize signals in you that perhaps you have mistaken for depression that are in fact the, the way the soul speaks and you don't know that because no one's ever taught you that. Nobody's ever taught you that that is the way the soul talks to you. What I know is that we do not know ourselves very well at all. Not at all. We are very naive about our world. We are very naive about um, the way we function, <laughs> about the organization of our universe. You grew up, we grew up believing that we were the only species in the whole universe. Do you understand how ridiculous that is? <laughs> and not only that, we are about to enter a galactic community. And we don't even know what that means. You have no idea how that's going to change your life, but it's going to change your life. <clears throat> and one of the ways it is already changing your life is it's changing the nature of God and how you understand God. And it's changing the way we present our myths of God. <clears throat> because you grew up, all of us grew up, on stories about God that were Earth-centric. Everybody's God came from the Earth. Everybody's God had something to do with human beings. All the Abrahamic traditions, their gods were all half God, half men. Messiahs. Holy Prophets, the Second Coming. And from that, you developed, we developed an idea that the cosmos was male-dominated. That not only were gods living on the planet that were men, they ran the cosmos. It wasn't enough that they ran the planet. <laughs> but the male ran the cosmos. We have so much to unlearn that has been programmed in us. To unlearn, okay, to unravel. One of the truths is that we have in us 
an illusion that if something is old and ancient, it's <coughs> inferior. That somehow those people who lived way back then were ignorant and inferior to us, that we are so superior because we have computers. <laughs> and because we have telephones and because we can fly. But in fact, it may well be that they could bilocate. That they were in fact very superior to us in how they understood the laws of energy over matter. That in fact, they they, they, I'm not sure if that's not what one of our students, if you'll excuse me for one minute, I just want to, I don't know if this is locked or, are you? Sorry. It's okay. That's on the first night, everybody comes in at, you know, so, um, so <clears throat> anyway, that in ancient times, what we call ancient times, that people who lived back then understood energy and the laws of energy over matter. And that through the centuries, what happened was people became matterized, densified. They went from living in a world of mist to becoming ice, dense. And so the laws of the universe, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> one more time. Hello? So the laws of the universe, it's okay. Um, went from being the laws of energy, thought over form, to the laws of form over thought. And people completely eventually forgot that incredible science of spiritual technology. In the days of Pythagoras, in the days of Plato, these were the days, in the days of Moses, in the days of the Egyptians, they knew these laws. You know, we look back and think, how did they move those stones at Stonehenge? How did they, and we think, they must have had a lot of slaves that pulled these rocks, because we use logic. We use logic, the logic we have today. Because we are not accustomed to having miraculous imagination, <coughs> spiritual imagination. We, we are, nobody has ever taught you how to get out of your body, how to get out of your body and travel into the realm Beth, would you please manage this door for me? So I really appreciate that. I appreciate it. Why don't you put her? I will. Yeah. Yeah. So nobody has ever taught people how to manage much appreciate it. The the rest of the workshop won't work like this. This is just this first evening where it's just the feeling it out. It's <laughs> I'm finding it very challenging to give a coherent lecture. Yeah. Ian, we have to turn this down a bit. Retrograde. Is it retrograde? Do you want me to go change my no, clothes? No, it's okay. <laughs> okay. Now am I good? You're good. Okay, I have to get myself. I feel like I'm fragmented all over the room. Just a second. Mm.
I'm going to come through a different door and I'll catch up with this. Let's go through a different door. You know, the, the power of holy language became a big thing for me because of my work in medical intuition. So let me just tell you how I came to this subject. Let me do it that way, because that's a perfect sub subject for a Friday, for a, the beginning of this workshop for a Thursday evening. Monday, what is this? Monday. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Who said anything about Mercury retrograde? <laughs> Um, uh, there was a time when I used to really be very cautious about what I would tell people about my personal spiritual life. And, um, but now, but now I find that um, as, as my work went in medical intuition from, I sound hollow. Do I sound hollow to you? What is that? Is that my blouse? Mercury. Okay. Okay, okay. No, that's it, no. Hello, hello. Is that it now? Is that? Okay, it's going to be a little imperfect this evening. Okay, we can deal with. What if I move? Would that help? It's the way. What if I hold the mic? Do you want to put your scarf on? It'll be fine. Just keep it. Okay. What if I held the mic? Okay, you all right guys. Thank you for bearing with me. We, we've got it because I just need to chat with you about this and enough with the technical stuff. I'm very sorry about that. All right, here we go. We'll get all the kinks out tonight. How's that? Um, when I started doing readings a long time ago, I had no interest in healing, nothing. I had an interest in trying to figure out why you got sick. Coming from a background in, in history and journalism and theology, I had no idea there were any such thing as chakras. I, nobody taught me that. I was educated by Jesuits and brilliant nuns. Nobody ever said, yeah. I almost wanted to go back to graduate school and get my money back because I said, Who, where did this come from? Where did this come from, right? So through the years when I was doing these readings, it never occurred to me. Whenever I would, my role was to tell you why you were sick and why, what the stress was. But I was learning along with every reading. I was like, wow, wow. It wasn't that I started because I knew what I was doing. I didn't know what I was doing. I was learning with every reading. When someone would say, but what should I do? When they were sick back in the 80s when I started, I was like, I don't know, go to a healer. You know, I, I, that wasn't my job. My job was to figure out why you were losing power, not to put you back together again. And I was fascinated, fascinated with that. Fascinated. But then eventually I thought, well, how come you're not, you know, how does healing work? So one thing led to another in my career, and I began to wonder, what is healing? And, and, and how, what would help you? And how to help you to get better? And eventually my path took me, because of the questions I was asking, it took me down the next stage to realizing that I, what, in doing a reading, what I was looking at was your management of power, how you managed power. That was the fundamental ingredient of the human experience, was power. That every choice you made, everything in life, every single everything about everything you do, how you dress, how you think, how, how you see the world, every single thing is a negotiation of power. 
absolutely everything. Life is the experience of power on its every level, from physical to emotional to psychological to spiritual to psychic to grace. Grace is the ultimate power. It is when you finally get that this, this whole journey is all about power. And the ultimate surrender is, you've given me so much power, I don't want to screw it up. So I'm giving it back to you and you tell me what you want to do, power through me, and we'll get along just fine. And that's the, that's the actual act of mystical surrender. It finally occurred to me that I have so much power. Every choice I make makes such a difference. Every word I say has so much authority in creation that I don't want to say anything unless it comes from you directly. Now, when I finally got into why people don't heal, I thought to myself, what's wrong with people? Why don't they want to be whole? Why don't they want to heal? And that was when I really saw how frightened people were of becoming conscious, of becoming conscious. That for all the effort people put into studying and reading and yada, 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 the fact is people are terrified of becoming whole and healthy. So they, they go through all this, all these journeys to becoming whole and healthy, but the truth is they're terrified of accomplishing that. Like, I just don't get it. They'll work so very hard to live a long time and then someone asks them their age and women go, oh, I don't ask me that. Well, then go and die. <laughs> what the hell's wrong with you? You work so hard to, to be healthy and live that way and someone asks you and you hang your head about, oh, no, no, don't ask me. I'm like, what is wrong with you? Tell someone how old you are. You should be proud of it if you've lived that long. And say, oh, no, no, because no one will think I'm marketable. It's exactly what you're saying. Shame on you. Put your head in the toilet for seven minutes. <laughs> Treat yourself that way. But anyway. But again, this has to do with power. This has to do with power. Every single thing in our lives is about our relationship to power. So when it came finally to the, the stage where m my life shifted into the mystical, when I had a, a relation, I got into I crossed the Rubicon. I had the experience with Teresa of Avila. My whole inner world went upside down. And I, um, I witnessed miracles. I witnessed healing. I became truly, truly interested, obsessed with getting you to heal. And, I, and you have to understand, I had no interest in it before at all. I was like, eh, make your bed, you lay in it. And now, <laughs> and now I was, oh my God, oh my God, this is no. And now I thought, so I started to think, you guys have got to wake up. You have got to wake up. You have got to stop dwelling on things that are insignificant and wake up to what is significant. You have to get how powerful you are and get rid of the things that don't matter. You really do. This, you really do. It, it's just you can't dwell one more day, one more second on things that don't make any difference. And you have got to start realizing all the difference you can make in the world in the blink of an eye. Now, when I started to witness some people heal. I would think to myself, how is it possible that some people could heal so fast and other people not? And this brings me back to the journey of the management of ourselves, to the journey of the management of what is consciousness. I'm right under. 
and that is, you know, as a baby Catholic, the stories of growing up are all stories of miracles and, and saints and you know apparitions, and that's one of the things I love about the church. They got a miracle for everything, and they got a saint for everything. You lose something, we got a saint. You you want to you want to sell your house, we got a saint. You know we got we got a saint for everything. It's so much fun, but. What is really true is that heaven ha is that close to you. Heaven is genuinely that close to you. That is, um, that's true. But, um, one of the impressions I got as a child and a young person was that you had to really pray all the time and light a thousand candles. Your house had to look like the burning of Rome in order to heal, and maybe you had to cross the street on your knees a thousand times, and God knows what, right? So I, I had the impression that miracles were rare, but they happened, but they happened. And then the day that I started on my book tour for entering the castle, it was the very, very day, the very day of that book tour, um, and Entering the Castle was my book with Teresa of Avila about her work. I was in my hotel room, and I'm getting ready to go out and speak. And I hear, you know, new newscasters, they say, you know, do, do, do ducks really, you know, dance and do elephants really fly? Stay with us. And, and they, they do those taglines so you don't change the channel because they're so appalling. But this, I, I was in my, in the bathroom and I was, uh, you know, puttering around, and I hear her say, do miracles really happen? Well, stay with us, and da, da, da. And I, so I go out there, and I'm sitting on the edge of my bed, and here, the story was about a miracle that took place on the college campus that I went to, my college, the woods in, Saint, in, in Terre Haute, Indiana, and in fact, it was declared a miracle by Rome, and the woman, the nun who founded the community has since been canonized the Eighth American Saint because of that miracle. And so they told the story of that miracle, and here's this reporter sticking a microphone in the face of Sister Kevin, and she says, so what exactly is a miracle? And Kevin looks at her and says, oh, well, that's when God bends the laws of the universe just for you. And you could see that she wanted uh, an answer that was, oh, wow, well, you have to have it. This nun was like, it happens all the time. God bends the laws of the universe all the time for people. And then this reporter says, and that's back to you now. <laughs> 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 because the answer was so accurate and so perfect when God bends the laws of the universe. So what I've learned is this, is that miracles happen all the time. You're the driver behind whether or not they could happen. The challenge is whether or not you could handle it. Whether you could handle it. Because what I've learned is that most people need a lot of validation in their life. They need validation for everything. For an idea they have, for an inner whisper, for whether or not their lunch is any good. You really like it? Do you really like it? Mm. For every single thing, every single minute. They need someone else from the outside world to tell them everything about them is OK. They need it 24-7. You're a lot of work. You take a lot of effort. But a miracle is something that cannot be validated, not by anybody, but you. And in fact, what happens is that you face a tsunami of people that will tell you it never happened, plus people who will be envious that, in fact, it did happen, but to you and not them. Why you? What's special about you? What's special about you? And you have no way to prove it, nothing. Because what's true about the inner life is you're on your own. You are totally on your own. 
There's nowhere to prove, validate, verify anything about the world behind your eyes. You're on your own. And so if you indeed had a miracle and you were healed, it's a really good, there's a really good chance people are going to say you really weren't that sick. You really didn't have that cancer. It's a freak thing. Something else. They'll look for another explanation for why and how you came to be healed. To try and find something. Because holy language and the way of the holy is just not in them. Just not in them. It's just not the way they think. Because everything is about what you can handle in your reality and the speed at which that happens. What I realized in my work, finally, and this is why I decided to spend so much time in this book, The Power of Holy Language, Prayer, Grace, and Guidance, is because I realized in these last 70 years, <clears throat> ever since we entered the nuclear age, we have been undergoing the most profound change in the history of humanity. There's, there, it is impossible for us to actually measure how much we are different from the species of human beings who lived before the nuclear age. We are actually physically different. We're physically different. Our immune systems are different. But so is our psychic field. You have multiple senses. You now think you live in the world behind your eye in a way the people before 1945 did. It would never occur to anybody before 1945 to say, I have to process this. I have to get in touch with myself. What are you talking about? Nobody prior to 1945 would say, I have a depression because I'm looking for the purpose and meaning in my life. And I can't find it. And I'm just, and that would be a reason for you to get to, to divorce and go on a walkabout. Do you understand? We are people on the inner plane now. We live on the inner plane. And the questions that you think about and you ask yourself so casually are not questions, they're prayers. They're actually prayers. They're mega, huge, big time prayers. When you say, I wonder for what reason I've been bored, who are you talking to? Who's going to answer that? Who do you think is going to answer that? You are invoking grace. You're invoking heaven. <clears throat> now, for these last many years, I have been dealing with health and healing and combining the two and looking at the difference between a spiritual crisis and a, um, a going into spiritual direction. And one of the things I realized, for example, is that people today can tell me with greater conviction what they do not have faith in than what they do have faith in. That's never, ever been the case before on this planet. Today we have more people questioning the existence of God on this planet. That has never, ever, ever, ever been the case for human beings. But today, human beings question whether there is a God. <coughs> today human beings decide there is no evil, there's only good. Today, we, we human beings decide to restructure the whole cosmic field because of what suits us. Not because of the way it really is, but because we're so narcissistic that we think we can reorder the nature of nature itself because it doesn't suit us. To have darkness, we only want light and angels. 
Do you understand? We've taken away certain vocabulary. We've decided there's no such thing as sin, just boo-boos and unfortunates. What I realized is that because we've taken out the language of the soul, we've broken a way to have access to our inner life. We've compensated by going to therapy when we should be plunging into our spiritual self. We've turned our spiritual life into the journey of healing instead of the journey of truth. What I realize is that most people <clears throat> have an inadvertent relationship with darkness and they don't even realize it. And they are terrified of the light. I'll give you a proof. We have a society where telling lies is okay. It's totally okay. It's not okay. There's nothing okay about it. Your soul does d completely goes contaminant. But in our world, we think it's okay now. We are surrounded in a culture where lying is okay. Accepted, normal. That's the new normal. Look at the world around you. That's being in darkness when that's the new normal. And part of this is the result of the absence of holy language in your life. Believe me, it is the result of that. It is the absence of thinking in terms of sacred dialogue in yourself, of absolutely accommodating the absence of the holy in your life. Okay. We threw out babies with bath water. We decided, you know, it's okay. I can make my spiritual path on my own. Nobody does the spiritual path on their own. And at the same time, I'm going to hit a pause button and take you into the cosmos. At the same time, what's happening is that our myths of God, the familiar myths of God, that we all grew up on in our own way, whatever. How many of you grew up in a traditional religion? Okay. How many of you grew up with nothing? There's no such thing as growing up with nothing. Something influenced you. Something filtered in. Science. <clears throat> Science. Do you have a Christmas? Do you ever have Christmas? Yeah. Then something filtered in. Okay. Christmas came from... Hello? There you go. So there was a Christian something or other in your atmosphere. There you go. It came in one way or another. <clears throat> you know, the stories of Jesus, the stories of Buddha, the stories of all of these characters in the cosmos, how we know the story of God, the, the story of heaven. These wonderful stories are stories of how we, how people wanted to understand the power of God in relationship to us. How does God's power, like, you want to write, you want to write prayers because you want to figure out if I say the right words, then I'll figure out how to get through to God. Every one of you has a superstition, which we could call your micro-theology, that you use in one way or another that you think helps you maneuver your version of God. I promise you, even, even you, the scientist, there's something you either will avoid saying, avoid doing, you knock on wood, you... Whatever it is, you have your own little micro-superstitious theology that you think helps you communicate a code to God. Agreed? 
Okay, agreed. And even though, is there any of here, is there anyone here where that is not true? See? Okay. Now, um, we can't help this. This is archetypal. We, we absolutely can't help it. It's, the, it's like primal in us. We absolutely can't help it. We will rub sticks together. We'll, we'll, we will find some, we'll put stones in the corner. We can't stop it because there's something in us that has to communicate with something greater than ourself. We just have to. We absolutely have to. What makes this moment so, and what, let me finish this way. And what we have always loved about stories and myths of God is that we squeeze ourselves in them and they tell us how God talks to us and how we should talk to God. That once upon a time there was this God and God said, I will come to me, come to me little children and I will take care of you. And we think, God, that's wonderful. God's this father, and, 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 and then there's Mary, and then there's this, and there's Yahweh, and, and, and everything, and this is how the heavens works, and this works for me. But what's happening now, and we can't stop it, and we know it, is that all those familiar stories are getting unplugged. And try as we may, we can't bring ourselves to believe them in the way we once did. We can't bring ourselves to pass them on to our children in the way our parents or our grandparents passed them on to us. As much as we would love to pass them on and say, this is real, this is true, it's not coming out of our mouths, and what's worse is not coming in our hearts. And yet, the longing to believe in something is aching in our soul so great, and this is what make, is making us spiritually vulnerable. Because it's not that we don't believe, it's that what it is we believe in. We are between myths. We no longer, it's freezing in here. We are, we are between the myths of the gods of the old world and the ones and the, and, and the divine, we are being of the god, the divine that is emerging within what I call your bio-spiritual ecological theology that I will explain to you this in the next few days. In, in the old theology that you grew up in or around, as we'll explain, not tonight, but tomorrow, I'll start. You were told about the laws God expected you to follow. And these were the laws of religions. But what you are discovering through the power of your consciousness is that your consciousness is telling you the laws that you have to follow within. This is how God is getting revealed to you. This is the power of God becoming revealed to you so that instead of the, the laws of God being external, you're, dis you're discovering, you're discovering, we are discovering God in our blood and in our bones, that God is the law of nature, and the law of nature is within us and around us, and that the law is conscious, and that as above, so below, that all life breathes together. And that as we heal ourselves, we heal the planet. We are one and the same. And that this is an, imp the nature of God is totally impersonal, but what makes this universe 
so holy and personal is prayer that somehow or other the laws of heaven the nature of God is totally impersonal gravity we jump we fall it doesn't matter who you are where you're from but every prayer is heard and everything you do matters and somehow all of our acts of creation matter and, our, and each of our souls is on a, this holy journey of, uh, on a divine path. But we are at this critical stage where we are at the end of the God that's out there that looks like us and we've reached the beginning of the God within and it's in our blood and bones, in our nature, and in the whole of the universe. We are into the cosmic divine. That's what this moment's about. Part of the way you experience it is that you are imploding and exploding at the same time. You are doing both. You, each one of you, is on this in this place where you are longing to know so much about yourself that you can't stop asking questions about yourself. You're on an endless discovery about what's inside of you and the world behind your eye. Who are you? What You can't stop wondering, what was I born to do? Why am I here? What, what, what do you want me, why don't you, your prayer every morning should be, what do you want me to do today? The only reason you don't hear God is because you can't take your hands off the steering wheel. It's because you're so afraid you might actually hear an answer. You might actually hear a voice saying, this is what I want you to do today. You might actually get an answer to that question. And you're so afraid your sanity. You might lose your mind. You will lose your mind. And thank God it's about time. Your mind has gotten you into nothing but trouble. You need your mystical mind to wake up. And hopefully by the time I'm done with you, <laughs> that's exactly what will happen. This is a moment of mystical awakening unlike anything else. The depressions that I see people, this massive epidemic of depression that people are on. Sorrow and depression, it's because somehow or other they know the world, the way it was, is over. It's over, it's slipping away from us. It's just slipping away from us. And we are so uncertain, and, and what we do is because we are so used to being five sensory creatures, we're, we we want to know where, what's going to happen next, where are we going, but you, we don't get that we are the engines of creation. We have to determine what will happen next. Everything that happens is how we choose things. Here's the pivotal moment, something you have to deeply ponder. You won't understand it, but I ask you, please, to take this in your soul and just ponder it. You know, from the beginning of forever, isn't that a wonderful sentence? <laughs> and I know that for a fact, the beginning of forever, but you know, what has always driven human beings is the need to create and the need to survive. Think about that in yourself. That, that the moment that something goes wrong, you shift gears, in this, like you have these two little gears in you, and they think, I have to figure out a way out of this. I have to figure out a way out of this. I have to, you, 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 you just, even, even in, in your kitchen when you're cooking, you think, I gotta cook my, I gotta, pff, maybe I'll use this, maybe I'll use that. And you just cook your way out of disasters, right? Right? And then if nothing else, you blame someone. She made it, right? <laughs> right? But, but you get my point. The need to survive has always relied on our need to create. 
and how we create increases our capacity to survive. These two are like wheels that go like this. They go like this. When we enter the nuclear age, for the first time in the history of forever that we know of, that we know of, we created something. We created something that destroy, could destroy us and there's nothing we can create that can outdo what we have created that destroys us. Nothing. Nothing. We finally have cr created something with such destructive power that it threatens our survival. And there's nothing we can create at all that can protect us, can, protect, can guarantee our survival now. Finally, one of the wheels has fallen off for the first time ever. And we know it. And we know it. Collectively, we know it. And I tell you, in my hunch, I have no way to prove this, so I'm going to ask you, put it in your gut and just pray on it tonight. See how it feels. I think because this has happened, I think what heaven has done is it's put us on an accelerated path of evolution. It is up to us to become a species. Our only alternative is that we must become a species incapable of using the destructive power we have created because we have no way to undo the creation of it. So we must become incapable of using it. That's the only thing. So if, as I look at each person, even down to how we suffer individually, even down to what our madness is like, even down to what our visions are like, even down to what our dreams are like, even down to, to our fears of, of commitment, our fears of even down to the way our fears have changed. Since when do human beings have a fear of commitment? We are tribal creatures. Since when do human beings have three and four and eight and ten parts? The, the way that we've morphed since the nuclear age has set us on a very different course. A very, very different course. We are not the same. We have become extremely more destructive and extremely more creative. We have accelerated in what we can create and yet at the same time become incredibly more barbaric at a time when that's the last thing we should be considering our progression. Do you understand? We, our capacity, we should, we should have long ago left those barbaric instincts behind, but we're waking them up. So it's very interesting to me. So it's as if we are at this place where we are waking up the, the light of us, the best of us, and confronting the worst of us. It's where every one of our choices matters now. Everyone. And included in these choices is how conscious do you want to be? What do you want to truly understand about yourself? How deeply do you really want to know who you are and why you're here and what you're capable of? That there are beings of light on this planet that, that, that are, that we're not alone, that we're not alone, that, 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 that prayer is about you invoking the presence of grace and guides in your life. That part of everybody's journey now is reaching a place where you are able to say, not my will, but thine, and you understand what that means. You have to understand what that means. 
that you're willing to say, okay, I, I had an agenda for my life, but now it's about me serving the whole, so I'll put that aside. And we'll talk about all of this tomorrow and the next day. But I cannot, I cannot help but believe that everybody who comes to me now in a workshop like this has some angel at his or her back. You don't find your way to me on your own. I don't believe that. I'm not teaching knitting. <laughs> I'm, that's your role. But I, you understand? I'm, 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 my, I'm in the business of setting a fire in your soul. I'm in the business of getting you going in your life in a way that you're not going. Or getting you to become hooked. And be, become plugged in and to not doubt that you're plugged in. When I was younger and when I was a little girl, I was always plugged into the other side. You know, when I hear people tell stories like, and I thought I was crazy, you want to know something? I never, I never thought I was crazy, not for one second. I thought you were. <laughs> and that wasn't arrogance. It wasn't arrogance. It was that I always wondered, how do you get through life so frightened? How in the world do you leave your front door so filled with fear? Because it never occurred to me. It never occurred to me, ever, ever. You know, when, when I was um, in my early 40s, I, I had seizure. I had some seizures, grandma seizures. And I, uh, and that's terrifying. That's terrifying, big, huge, not little, big, huge. And one time I was uh, in my kitchen and I had, uh, my counter has a square, had a square edge like this and it had tile and then it had a hard tile floor and I had a chair like this at the counter, you know the classic little up counter. And I'm on a chair exactly like that. And I felt a grand mall coming in. And you, it's like a black thing starts and you begin to go out. And I looked to see if I could make it to my couch and I knew I wasn't going to. And if this chair goes back, I'm gonna break my neck. I'm gonna break my neck and that would be it. That would be it. And then I heard the voice of my guide. It said, let go, I've got you. It's okay. Let go, I've got you. I just went, Poof. you know what? I woke up, that chair was 10 feet away, and I was lying on the tile, not a bump on my head. Not a bump on my head. And it didn't occur to me that that could not happen. Didn't occur to me, never occurred to me that it didn't happen, it couldn't happen, never. I'll tell you how, how extreme this is with me, sometimes the extreme of insanity. Um, so I had, I had a bear in my, uh, do you know how honey comes in a bear, the plastic bear? So I had it in my cabinet and I had a friend staying with me for months and months and months and she was filling the bear but I didn't know that. I thought, well, of course. <laughs> and she, she's, and I said to her, very casual, I said, it's the most incredible bear. <laughs> and her jaw went, she went, are you crazy? And I was, no, well, what's her? And she said, I said, what the? And, and, and it did. If that had it been, it wouldn't have even struck me as being odd. Do you understand? That's how. She said, what the? And you know, and that's where I live. That's how, yeah, that's what I have to tell you. That's really, it doesn't even occur to me that that couldn't happen. I know. <laughs> doesn't even occur to me that that can happen. That's how I think heaven works. Why wouldn't it? But it doesn't even occur to me. And if it had been, it thinks, well, yeah. Well, yeah. I know. It's crazy, huh? 
But it's not crazy. I think heaven is that close because that has always been my experience. And if somehow I can chip away for you the doubt that you think that somehow it's located way up there and that part of what is, I think, a blockage is that people think that a proof of God is that things should go smoothly in life. No, 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 no. That has nothing to do. You have to understand how life is. Life is pain and death and birth and this. There's no, it's always going to be that. So that has nothing to do with it. It's got nothing to do with you thinking that God's on your side and therefore, you know, bad things will stop happening to you. You have to understand that that's not how the nature of God is that whatever, is that you get a grip on how you see yourself, what's going on in your head, what your attitudes are, and the power that's in your attitudes. And that the way heaven works is like, your prayer is like, get a hold of me, God, because I need some grace and I need it fast because I am like really angry right now and I can do some damage. And that's how you pray. Because you finally get a hold of the truth that you are power. And you start praying about managing your power. Not having the world change around you, but helping you change the world for the best through you. You get it? And then you start seeing allies and angels showing up everywhere, because now you got the rules. Do you have any questions? No, just a few, eh? What, what's up? Oh, what's up? I'll repeat. I want to tell you about what you just said about Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, yeah. OK. So just talk. I just want to tell you about what you said about chipping away at, at um, your own perception of how things can happen. Um, because I want to share it with the group on Leslie. And I was in Colorado. And on the Is your mic working? No. I didn't want to hear it. Yeah. All right, never mind. Just speak up. So Wait, I'll. On the, on, the Friday evening, on the Friday evening, there was a talk. And then um, I was riding my bike, and I met some people in the lo uh, person in the lobby who was staying at the same hotel, who offered me a ride the next day. And when I got in the car, there were three of us. And as we drove to your the next day, the Saturday morning, we all shared stories of how we'd had a death experience. And it was like, did you eat hummus last night? I drowned when I was a kid. The, and a woman from Sydney had flown in, had a stroke. I had a fentanyl overdose in the hospital in emergency by an error. In, Medicine. And um, and we talked about it like we ate hummus last night. It was no big deal. And I didn't realize till I left and got home. Well, was ever does everybody who goes live to Carol Mays have had a death experience? I only <laughs> deal in reborns, right? <laughs> I know. Isn't that funny? Isn't that funny? I know. I know. But think about how your conversations are these days. Within minutes, you find out if someone you know has had a near death experience or this or that, right? Again. Think about it, from before World War II and now in nuclear consciousness, the day that my father, this World War II Marine, if you think he sat around talking to people about whoever said to my mother, you know, I got, I got to go and get a past life, you know. It, no, but look at what's normal for you. Look at what's absolutely normal for you. Look at what's in your head that's totally normal for you. Past lives, future lives, up this, that, and the other. You know, it, you could have a near-death experience and you think, oh man, I saw this tunnel and, and I, 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 I know people and it's absolutely normal to go, have, go meet with a medium and talk to people on the other side and that's ordinary. So your worlds are becoming incredibly porous porous it has to be you have to you really really have to understand how important it is 
that you have a vocabulary, that you have holy language in you. Did you, you be able to recognize what a spiritual crisis is versus a depression? That you don't call something um, uh, a depression when in fact your soul is in crisis. You have to be able to recognize. You have to have the right vocabulary. You have to be able to speak soul fluently these days. And not within a religious context. You have to transcend the way people used to think that we're talking religion. Religion is, is evaporating. And what we have to pull from religion are the mystical vocabulary that, that needs to sustain us as we move into the next centuries. That there are certain words that you have to understand the significance of the sacraments and your chakras. These are not rituals that belong to the church. Those are rituals that belong to the soul that the church recognized. To understand what these were and that when the soul does not have ritual, the soul goes into crisis. And it's been treated with drugs instead of ritual. So all of this is stuff, Wilt, is this is what you need to recognize. Yes? Hi, my name is Fern Marie. I found you by accident three weeks ago, and uh, I'm here right now. Where are you from? I, originally from Puerto Rico, but I was a scientist, engineer, until two years ago I had an instant moment of, oh my God, what on earth am I doing with science? I was always trying to connect to energy. <laughs> but anyway, um, led me to a physics degree, so it's nice. So as a scientist, I understand neuroscience really well. I understand that our minds, our behaviors, the pineal gland, sorry, the, the um, basal ganglia is the one uh, uh, organ that, or gland that allows you to create habits very, very, very well. And what I've noticed is as I've discovered my own power is that I have to go back and reprogram a lot of habits, a lot of belief systems. Even having power and being afraid of my own power has to do with my memory of other people in power that have done awful things. And my being afraid of, will I do those things? And I don't want to do those things, so therefore I don't want my own power. So my question to you is, how much, how do you balance having to go back and reprogram everything you've learned for 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years versus going towards something that automatically removes that? Do you have to go through the pain of rewiring everything you've learned or have you found a shortcut? <laughs> well, it's a brilliant, sophisticated, wonderful question. And this is what I think. I think you can take a shortcut. I think that's what forgiveness and transition is all about. I think that when a person, um, if we choose, if we're somebody who thinks, I, uh, here's the brilliance of Buddha and Jesus, and they're teaching that there's nothing back there. Stop going backwards. And one of the great teachings of both of these masters is the, the teaching of it's all illusion. And that's something that we'll focus on, but here's the essence of it. The, we, one of the great challenges for us is to get that, in fact, all those things we've been taught um, or the things we've experienced are illusion. Now that's hard to grasp, because if you've been raped or you've been beaten up, that's no illusion. That is no illusion. But what the illusion is, is that you're the only one that it's ever happened to. And that somehow or other, by going back again and again and again and again, you can make the rape not have happened. Or you can make it fair. 
or you can somehow or other get justice in enough way to finally satisfy your hatred or finally satisfy your resentment. That's the illusion. There isn't enough going back in the world. You can't tell your story enough for vengeance. Vengeance, there is not enough. You could tell your story a million times and vengeance will say, I want it a million and one because there is no end to it. Finally, Jesus says, that's what the illusion is. You think, you want, you think, you think going and shooting someone and going and rubbing their face is going to make you feel better? That's the illusion. That's the illusion. That you'll find fairness on this earth, that you'll make anything fair. There's nothing that's fair here, and it never will be. Get that. That's what Buddha says. This is all an illusion. You think you're down here to make things work? You're crazy. You're down here to deal with the fact that nothing will ever work. That's the truth. But habits are not an illusion. No, no. But habits are an illusion. Yes. They're repetitive. They're so, re they're so programmed in there, right? No. A program, anything can be reprogrammed. Well, that's the question. And then all you have to do is decide, I, can't, I have to reprogram this. I'm stronger than this. What wins, the habit or me? No, of course, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And it's just like every single little thing. So you talk about earning power and gaining your power back. Mm -hmm. I do nothing else but that in every single instant. Even like the way that you look at someone, it's like, oh, are you going to... Right. Allow a habit to right. jump in here. Exactly. It's everything. I every know. Second. Isn't it awful? <laughs> yeah. So but is there a break? Yeah. <laughs> yes, there is. And then you just said, I've won. At some point, there comes the second when you're not playing the game. When you, don't, when you realize five seconds went by and I wasn't even conscious of it. And then pretty soon it will be 30 seconds and you realize you've had a shift of consciousness and you're leaving that world behind. Trust me. So you just keep at it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. Hi, I'm Cynthia. I have been waiting three months to ask you this and it's a fun question. As I'm learning about holy language from you, I'm so grateful. Um, when you say, God, get me out of this mess, I'm going to bed. Do you pray out loud? Do, do you I? Really speak do me? Loud? Yeah, sometimes I do. Yeah, I, I've been wondering. Yeah, that no, me, yeah. I, yeah, I, sometimes I do. Sometimes I'll say, are you kidding? Are you there? Get me out of this place. I'm going to bed. Do you notice a difference praying no. internally versus no, 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 speaking no. out loud? I, do, here, all right, so I'll tell you the truth. I pray a lot. <laughs> That's the truth. I pray a lot. I, I pray a whole lot. I don't understand how this happened to me. Sometimes I'll say, you know, you've made me nothing but a damn nun. You won. But it makes me laugh. It makes me laugh now. It makes me laugh. And I don't get why I'm so happy. I'm, I'm really deeply, profoundly happy in some way that I can't explain That's, that is ha happy in a way that I have never been happy when I was trying to make my own life what I thought it would be. I just, I can't even, sometimes I wake up and think, I think I'm crazy, I'm so happy. But it's not that, it's like all the things that would bother, you know, getting older and you're like this, all of those fears have been like unplugged. There isn't anything. I look and think, we're indefeatable, you and I. You and I, we're indefeatable. So, I can't, and believe me, there's a, but, so that's how I pray. And, and you know, sometimes and I'll say, and, I, and honestly, and sometimes I'll say, you know, when I, I see people on the street, and I'll say, help them. I wonder, I didn't have been doing it out loud at home yeah. in front of my dogs, and they just kind of look at me. Yeah, yeah, good. Like, so thank you for answering yeah, that. Yeah. It works both ways for you. Yeah, oh yeah. yeah. And it doesn't, you know, like I, I have family members in need, and what I wouldn't get, you know, what I wouldn't give to see their lives change in front of my eyes. 
in front of my eyes. And it's not happening. And, and even then, in my heart, I know I, can't, I cannot move their lives to satisfy my own grief. I can't. But that does not change my belief or the truth of how heaven works. I simply have grown to understand how heaven works. And it's, it doesn't work in order to make me happy. I work in order to, I finally got the rules. I finally got the rules. So do you, do you mind if I close down with a prayer? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Okay. Let's see what I've got here. This could be good. Okay. Close your eyes, everyone. Lord, bless this journey that is today as I go down deep into the vast territory of my soul. Just when I think I know myself, I discover a stranger living inside of me. I must accept the truth that I am an endless unknown creature, even to myself, but perhaps especially to myself. With every new experience, I have to wonder, how will I cope? How will I respond to that? What will I say? I can never be certain what I'll do next. There's so much about myself that I do not yet know or understand. Why then should chaos surprise me? I'm spinning in a wind tunnel watching fragments of my life rush by so often. It's not up to you to stop these fragments, Lord. There's no prayer that will move heaven to piece together the odds and ends of my life, but you have given me the authority. It's up to me to become more aware and more attentive and more focused. That's my decision. Clarity of mind and soul will change how I live my life. A chaotic life ends up tossed about by fate, that much I know. But clear-mindedness leaves room for courage and bold choices. And I know that self-knowledge is the pathway to my soul, so take me down deep, Lord, and reveal to me the reason you gave me life. Amen. Thanks for being here. We're going to have a good time. <laughs>